Hello, this is John Danaher, and I would like to congratulate you both on 100 episodes of my favorite BJJ podcast, BJJ Mental Models. This is an incredible achievement. Because of both of you, Matt and Steve, more people have been exposed to the idea of alignment, the theory stolen from me by Professor Robert Bernanke. More people have adopted a conceptual and systems-based approach to grappling. More people have analyzed their own learning styles and become better learners, not just in jiu-jitsu, but in life. From the beginning, recording episodes in your mother's closet next to her pantyhose, it wasn't always obvious you would become a success. But through pure grit, determination, consistency, and Steve's fine self-taught audio engineering skills, you are finally a tolerable listen. Not only has your work greatly benefited the BJJ community, but has greatly padded the wallets of Gordon Ryan and myself. Both of you buggers mention us almost every episode, which is both flattering and depressing. Some jiu-jitsu podcasts out there fall short and just rely on star power, but do not offer any actual educational value. Between Matt's cats and Steve's delusion over the turtle position, you both never cease to entertain me, and so I would like to again congratulate you both on a job well done and many more years of success. Thank you for the countless hours of dedication and hard work you have both put forth. BJJ Mental Models is the finest jiu-jitsu podcast in the world. It is my favorite thing to listen to while taking the subway, washing the dishes, taking a bubble bath, or perhaps a stroll in the park. I, John Danaher, am forever grateful for this contribution. I look forward to many more years of great shows. Bye-bye for now. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode one freaking hundred. I'm Steve Kwan. And I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. Matt, I can't believe we're still here. Yeah, 100, 100 episodes, eh? Wow. Not many podcasts get that far. You know, most of them peter out or they lose their motivation. Looking at you, Keenan and Josh, just disappear. Although they're back now, I guess I shouldn't actually. Yeah, I think they just released another episode. I haven't listened to it. Yeah, it's hard. It's kind of like jujitsu, you know, if you stay consistent with it and you keep putting out the stuff, then over time it adds up and yeah, you get somewhere. There is kind of like a blue belt blues when it comes to podcasting. Everyone, when they start doing it, they get really excited. And then, you know, after they've done about 10 episodes and they realize it's a lot of work, they kind of lose their motivation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But once you get past that hump and you commit to it, it actually gets a lot easier. You learn a lot. And that's actually what we wanted to talk about today. You know, we've had this big run up of guests from episode 90 through to episode 99. And we do have a few more guests in the bank as well. In the process of booking these, we got some other good ones who were coming on. We'll probably wind up doing more of those in the future too, because I think we've got it down to a science now. But we were thinking 100 episodes in, What better way to cap off that massive milestone than to maybe talk about some of the biggest and most important lessons that we've learned in this journey? Uh, There's definitely been a lot. I know that many of our listeners, some of which have been with us from episode one or otherwise early on, but I also know that a lot of our listeners have joined us relatively recently. So when they hear us talk about like cats and taints and all of this weird stuff, they probably have no clue as to why we're doing it. (laughs) And in between that, there's actually some semi-valuable jujitsu chatter in there in the interim as well. So was thinking it might be a good idea to use this milestone to maybe recap some of the biggest and most important things we've learned during this journey. What a journey it's been. (laughs) It has been. It's hard to believe, but 100 episodes, I mean, that's basically almost our two-year milestone as well, because we've, without fail, done one episode every week since we started at the beginning of 2019. So it's almost our two-year anniversary as well as being episode 100. I think one thing that we sort of learned was just the idea of trial and error, because 
it's very difficult to keep things consistently, you know, going at a smooth rate, especially when you're starting. It takes time to work out the bugs. And there's been a lot of bugs. I know, Steve, you've you've basically taken care of the audio, you know, producing the show, a lot of the marketing of, of, of the, basically all of the administrative aspects of the show. So I think uh, no one knows better than you about trial and error here, but really to get a, a great polished product in anything, it really takes a lot of trial and error, a lot of failure and just sort of seeing what works and using what works and then sort of disregarding what doesn't work. So it's funny how uh, jiu jujitsu can be that way too, but I think anything, especially when you're new, there's going to be a degree of you fail a lot at first and then you learn. And in this case, you know, I think you self-taught yourself a lot. And now we have a product that is actually somewhat successful. So it's kind of a kind of a cool thing to see. Yeah, it's kind of cool because, you know, we've always said that one of the great things about jujitsu is that it's a vehicle for growth because a lot of the strategies you use to get better at jujitsu are just as applicable at learning anything. And on this podcast, when talking about jujitsu, we've talked about things like investing in loss and how you have to really go through that trial and error process. And, you know, when you start off anything new, it's going to be rough at first. And that's kind of what makes it intimidating. I mean, I remember when I started jujitsu, you know, <laughs> I was terrible at, at first and, you know, I'm still terrible at, but I'm terrible professionally now at jujitsu. Whereas at the beginning, I just had no idea what I was doing. And in order to start anything new, you've got to be willing to be bad at it from the get go. And <laughs> anyone who goes back and listens to our early episodes will know that there has been a dramatic uptick in quality all that way through and not just audio quality. I mean, at the beginning, you know, this was new to us. Matt and I just sat down with a mic and we just huddled around it together. And it took us a while to figure out how to do acoustics and how to do sound editing and also to get a flow for this podcast and to kind of really have an idea of what this thing was going to be and what our concepts were. And it's evolved very much that whole way through. And it, it's been interesting having some of these guests on recently because they don't have that kind of flow that we do where, you know, Matt and I, at this point, we can sit down and we can just talk and a, a decent episode will come out because we've got that rhythm and we know what the show should be. So it's been funny trying to bring on these guests because they're all brilliant in their own way, but a lot of them don't understand the product or how we communicate information. <laughs> so, you know, Matt, you will attest sometimes having a guest on, it requires a lot of like editing and coaching to, to get it right when you've got a third party in here who doesn't know how the rhythm goes. Yeah, I think most of the recordings are pretty raw and I actually kind of like that, but you you do a good job of editing the episodes and making them sound um very smooth and uh you know make make guests sound smart, smarter than they already sound. Yeah, the the editing is a is a big part of it that I don't even see. Steve takes care of that entire piece himself, so that's why our, the quality continues to get better. And then even now with the with the lockdown and or the socially distancing thing, at first it was kind of different because Steve and I were used to sitting across from each other, uh, seeing each other's faces, and like it's easier to have a conversation when you can kind of you know have each other's body language and, and whatever facial expressions. But then when you take that away and you do remote recording it becomes a lot more difficult so it's again taken another period of adjustment for us to be able to have a conversation like that and then when we have a guest quite often it gets choppy and difficult to especially i find in groups of three or four it's difficult to see it's hard who's gonna go first you know when someone stops and someone starts so we we do have tools like a hand raise button and mute buttons and things like that but it's also different from being in a room with someone and being able to talk so there was a you know, again, it's it's just another level of sort of adaptation when it comes to something like this. But every, everything you hear, Steve goes through great lengths to edit and doctor up the sound so that it's crisper and clear. You know, there's always like weird beeps and humming noises uh, where I usually record. So what the fuck are those? So for those who don't know, I, I don't know. I, I kind of don't even want to talk about this because once people <laughs> hear it, they'll never unhear it. But for for reasons we don't understand, like Matt often records in his gym and every like 60 seconds you hear this little tiny beep in the background and, and maybe no one notices it but me but it drives me nuts i think i've finally figured out how to edit it and get rid of it but i'd love to know what it is because like maybe your building is having like an electrical fire or something you maybe. know it, it might be really important maybe we shouldn't be ignoring it <laughs> I, I i have no idea or, or either that or it's the cats or it's well let's be honest people love the cats people love it when the cats interrupt that's true they are great cats, although 
it's so weird. My cats are puking so much lately and it's Yeah, fucking, mom told me that you were having cat puking problems. Now, I have a question. Yeah. Isn't that just cats being cats? Because my cats puke all the time. That's what I thought. And I was like, well, I don't really feel the need to take them to a vet because A, it'll be annoying and B, they're still eating. They're not, their mood hasn't changed. You know, if they weren't eating and they were losing weight and they were all uh, lethargic and acting differently, I'd be concerned, but they're not. They're just literally being assholes. <laughs> like the other night, my my boy cat, Clay, he he puked up like all of his cat food and it just looked like undigested cat food. So basically a log of kibble on the ground. Then he proceeded to puke up a bunch of just clear liquid, but his attitude is the same. He's happy. So what we've done is we've sort of, we're starting to gradually change him over to just clean protein. Like both cats are going to start getting just boiled chicken, boiled salmon. And and if any or any of our listeners has recommendations for healthy alternatives for cats, like natural sort of whole foods, I'm all ears because I'm, I'm thinking it could be a dietary issue. I think the kibble that we get them from Costco just ain't cutting it anymore. Cats are super finicky when it comes to diet. I mean, it's, it's actually kind of funny because I consider the lengths that we have to go through to keep our cats alive. And I'm just wondering, you fuckers would never survive out in the wild. Like you wouldn't last a day. You need designer kibble and only the finest walnut based cat litter. Like you fuckers would be dead in 30 minutes if I put you outside. <laughs> you have walnut cat litter? We So we've switched. We've tried a bunch of different types of litter. We at first used this corn stuff that we like because it was flushable and you didn't have to, you know, take it to the garbage. And that was nice. But the problem was it like left this weird dust powder all over the house. Yeah. So we didn't really like that. We switched it's to- It's so a dusty. It is cat litter. We switched to a clay based litter and that was that was really, really good. Um, but recently we found this that is based on I, I think it's walnut based litter and it doesn't smell like at all. So when you've got a cat like that's the most important thing. So we've been using that. We've been pretty happy with it. But back to your original point about the food. So we used to have problems with our cats where I mean, you know, when people say explosive diarrhea, there were literally explosions. Like I remember there was a time God. when like my cat, I, I saw her and she was just like sitting there and she did like a, a fart shit <laughs> where like she, she farted. It's called a shart. Yeah, a shart. And like literally it like, it was like spray paint against the wall behind her. Like it was just disgusting. Wow, that's, um, and, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's not that big either. So we got them onto this hypoallergenic cat food that we got from the vet and that made all the difference. There's just, I think there's stuff in, you know, a lot of the processed kibble that you buy that might not agree with them and cats also have really sensitive digestive tracts so it takes some experimentation so yeah we found this at the vet that's supposed to be good for cats that have allergies and it, it's worked out well for years so that definitely solved that problem and they don't puke well every once in a while they do i mean that's just kind of part of cats being cats but they're still eating they're still happy they're still healthy so it, it is what it is they they'll puke every few days yeah. Yeah, those cats can be challenging when when I'm trying to record and also kids like, for example, uh, on one of the previous episodes with Lachlan and Livia Giles, my kids kept waking up and I was kind of absent throughout the conversation because I had to keep hitting the mute button and go put them <laughs> down and I'd miss sizable portions of the episode. So thank God I got you here to <laughs> keep it going. It's it's interesting. Like, man, you know, I envy those people who live in places where property value is really cheap and they can have like these giant houses where they can build entire recording studios and they can just have like one soundproof room for podcasting. I would love to have that because here in Vancouver, like there's always a shortage for space. And so a big challenge to doing this podcast is how do we create the ideal recording environment? And like you said, Matt, you know, we've gone through a lot of ups and downs over the years you know originally we recorded together um, and now because of covid we record remotely which has its strengths and weaknesses right i mean we had to totally relearn how to do audio because like matt mentioned it you lose those social cues when you don't have someone's face in front of you and it's also a lot harder to get really good audio quality and i, I think we figured it out and 
through editing, I try to make it sound like this is a natural in-person conversation. Hopefully it works out well, but yeah, there's so many variables when you're recording from home that can come up. Your cats can come screaming into the room. Your kids can come screaming into the room. Um, all sorts of weird things can happen. And like you said, when you get that third person on and they don't necessarily have that flow with us and they're confused about when to talk and when not to talk. And I mean, don't even get me started on like trying to get clean audio from a third person. I mean, we've had guests on where, you know, they've got like kids screaming in the background and then I've got to edit that out. Mm. (laughs) So it's definitely a challenge. I mean, I would say that for every 15 to 20 minutes of audio that we record, it takes about one hour of editing to clean that up and get that really, really good. And it's not even just, you know, removing background noise. It's also cleaning up the flow of the conversation and you know if people are talking over each other I try to edit that out and clean that out so realistically I know that a lot of podcasters don't go to those kinds of lengths but I think the fact that we do is what differentiates us because I want our podcast to be a top quality educational resource right and not many other podcasts will go to the lengths that we do to try to make the information solid and digestible and accompany that with like written material and a database of concepts so that kind of stuff I think is what is really allowed us to grow over the the relatively short two-year period that we've been doing this. And I think a, a big reason we've grown is because we started out doing this literally just for fun. It was something we felt like no one was doing and someone should do it. We should be documenting all of these concepts and learning models. And we never did it with the intent, at, at least at first anyways, to to get a huge return out of it. It was just mm-hmm. because we felt that it needed to be done and that, uh, you know, it was missing sort of from the world of podcasts and it would be a great idea. And then as it grew, as we made adjustments and uh, started getting guests on and, you know, learning, getting better gear, learning different things about how uh, b- building to our database and just growing in general, we started to create premium content for the patrons and now you know we're starting to see some returns so it's it's good i find i find at least for me anyways when i do something i i try and i try and get motivated from a place of passion and then mm-hmm. from there it kind of grows organically and and uh, and that way it's more rewarding when you get monetary gains as a result Well, it's like you said when you talked in the earlier episodes about opening your gym and how following your passion and being passionate about a quality product, that's what's going to get you somewhere, right? And if you do that, then the money will follow. And I mean, this podcast does not by any stretch make enough money to live off of, but it's still super rewarding to get that that paycheck at the end of every month and then to be able to, you know, split it with Matt. And it feels like we've really earned it. And even though, you know, it's it's not... By any means, is it a sustainable, livable wage at at this point, although I'd like it to be, you know, I, every dollar that I earn from the podcast is so it feels better. <laughs> it feels so much better than like anything that you do on a regular job. You know, I'm yeah. much more thankful for the stuff that I do on the podcast and the money we make off of the podcast than any money that I make from a regular job, because it's like this is a it's a passion project that is producing returns, which is so rare and so cool. And that's one of the other things about the podcast, too, that I've found uh, really, really uplifting is I always assumed that, you know, when you kind of created a public persona and you started to become known as a public figure, I always assumed that that would be a, a super negative experience. And I think the reason why I assumed that is because when you look at these guys who do have these huge followings... A lot of them do nothing but relentlessly shit on their own audience and how awful they are. (laughs) Like, you know, (laughs) like, and this is, you know, you look at guys like Tom DeBlass and Keenan and like, they're, they're very preoccupied with the haters. And so when I, when we started to get a a following here, I thought like, oh shit, you know, this is going to be awful. We're going to have people up our ass constantly hating us and, you know, just causing trouble. I've actually been pleasantly surprised by how rare that is. I mean, I would say that, 99.9% of the feedback we get is super, super supportive and really, really flattering a lot of the time to receive. It it is very, very rare that we get 
anything even remotely resembling hate mail. And even when we do get like that negative email, usually it's just like brutally honest criticism. It's not like you guys suck, you need to retire. It's usually just someone has really, really blunt feedback, which is still very, very valuable. <laughs> retire from what? <laughs> like what? <laughs> what do you mean retire? <laughs> do you retire from this? Like, it's like if you retire from jujitsu, it's like, well, if you can put on a gi, you, you never really retire. Right? Well, sometimes people are like, you suck so bad at this. You shouldn't even do this. I mean, we don't get that a lot, but I know that that's a, a common internet response, right? Is, you know, yeah. if you get a big enough public following, you're going to get people who just tell you, you suck, go away, which is hilarious when you're offering a free product. I mean, it's exactly. It's they couldn't say that because it was for free. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I know Stefan Kesting has talked about where he's like, he'll give away tons of stuff for free and then people will respond to bitch about it. And he'll be like, I'm sorry that you didn't enjoy this free product that I slaved over to make for you. Right? Yeah. So I, I do also find that kind of funny when people like they get upset about not getting what they want from a free product. I mean, I, I understand it and, and I am thankful for the feedback, but it's, it is still kind of funny when people get really uppity about it, especially when they didn't actually pay for it. Yeah. And because we we wanted to give this away for free for so long, I mean, I think eventually we were like, OK, once we get enough steam and we've we've supplied enough content and there's enough following, it's it's only right that we start to get some support, which we totally did. Mm -hmm. But leading up to that, we, we never really asked for anything. It was just like, here's information that we put out, you know, take it for what it is. We literally recorded this in our in our parents fucking closet like this is a <laughs> this is a very raw product at first but then i think both of us in different ways are perfectionists to some degree so it just sort of uh we tried to find different ways to improve the show and uh, another thing we've done is sort of uh you know i think i think we're doing a good job of thinking outside the box like mm -hmm. steve will come to me and say oh, okay like i think this week maybe we should do a little newsletter or how would you feel from now on we'll start rele releasing articles on a weekly basis or Let's do some uh, narrated roles or whatever. And and then from there, the ideas kind of just snowball. And I don't know, you get to a point where it's like you, you kind of just trust each other to to put content out there and um, and be creative. And that's, you know, you said, Steve, when you have a passion product and it's a uh, project and it starts to it starts to make money, it's so much more rewarding. And I think when you when you get to do something that brings money in and you get to be creative and you know, you see ideas turn into really well thought out products and then they start to have a, um, a return. It, it's even more rewarding. So that's really something that I've enjoyed about this this project as well is just being creative and sort of going with whatever ideas come to mind. Yeah, I didn't understand at first how much I would enjoy using BJJ Mental Models as a vehicle to try new things and to get creative because, I mean, it's not just a podcast, right? We've got the newsletter, we've got the Discord, we've got the book, we've got so much stuff. So we get to use this as kind of a launching point to provide other stuff to people that might be of value and some sticks and some doesn't. Uh, and we get to experiment and try to make this as useful as it can be. And the one thing that we're always trying to think about is, what is the niche that we can fill that nobody else is filling, right? You know, we don't want to necessarily just create another, you know, deep half guard instructional or something that's been done over and over and over again to death. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about our approach that I like is it, it's very unique, you know, trying to teach jujitsu through a podcast. Mm -hmm. And then even within that niche, it's very unique in the way that we do it. So it's, it's been interesting and fun trying to carve out our own little place of the world where, you know, we, we do something very, very different and hopefully valuable to the people that listen. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I found interesting and Matt, I'd be curious to, to know if you agree is I found that just the process of doing this podcast has made me actually better at jujitsu, which I did not expect. I know that, you know, as you get to black belt, we've talked about this before, how once you get to a certain level, sometimes the best learning vehicle is actually to teach because it forces you to organize your thoughts, right? I mean, if you've seen, I don't know, an arm bar from guard thousands of times, maybe drilling it a few more times is not gonna really clarify your knowledge of it, but actually trying to teach it it forces you to think and clarify your thoughts in a way that can actually improve your ability to roll. And I've actually found the same thing with the podcast, which is that by having to make this show and by having to spend so much time trying to organize my thoughts into mental models, it's actually really clarified my understanding of jujitsu as a whole in a way that I don't get from just training on the mat. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, something about also putting the ideas into uh, words and conversations as mm -hmm. opposed to videos is something that I don't know what it is. It makes you think about it differently. Like you said, you have to manage your own mental models in your mind. At least I find I have to do that to such a degree, especially when we're putting things down on paper as like, okay, this is a rule that I, I'm trying really hard to break, but I, I haven't broken it yet when I come uh, and think about it. So therefore, I, th I find it to be uh, inherently true. Um, wh whether it's one of our concepts or whatever. And if, and a lot of the time in the process, I end up sort of disproving myself. I'm like, oh, well, that's not an idea that belongs on the database because yeah, you, we've kind of proven it wrong here. So it's a great way to test theories and to get deeper understandings in certain topics. Like for me, uh, like blading was a huge example of, of a concept that really changed the way that I I roll it's essentially it's just changing the force factor you know it's just like it's imagine a striker circling and, ch and creating angles that's that's really what blading is in a grappling context mm -hmm. and applying force in different directions and that change of force and direction it really confuses the person on the bottom so it's a great way to set up guard passing uh, and that is something that is super important for me because I was having issues passing with pressure. Even when I got my black belt, like I, I didn't really consider myself a very effective pressure passer, but now, you know, I've learned so much about that. So that concept, you know, I had to put that concept onto paper and, and think, okay, well, if this is going to be up on the internet for everyone to see, I don't want any work that I've done on, and it's, it's public for everyone to see. I don't want people to be messaging me being like, oh, I disproved this. Like, this is a, <laughs> this is something that, you know, it doesn't work or whatever. Or you plagiarize this or whatever. And, and so I want it to, uh, whatever goes on our database, I want to sort of um, maintain its value, maintain its integrity. And we've already done a, a complete revision of all the mental models from the first time that we put it out. So we're constantly upgrading things, updating it, trying to make things better, trying to make things more accurate. Or maybe there's a concept where, oh, like I've realized there's another portion to this that we haven't discussed yet. So I'm going to review that topic or I'm going to review that article and refresh it and sort of revamp it. So we're always just trying to make make things as good as we can on the uh, on the database and, and all the other outlets of the podcast. Yeah. And sometimes I find that when we put something out there, one of the things I, I love about putting things out there is we've got a lot of listeners who are domain experts in various walks of life. Um, I was just talking to one of our listeners the other day who is a surgeon and he was talking about how interesting it is that he uses the same learning tactics at work as he does on the mats and that our podcast is one of, you know, the only places where we acknowledge that that is a thing. And we talk about it mm -hmm. in depth and I love how sometimes we put something out there. And I mean, our ideas aren't perfect. You know, we don't know everything. And a lot of the time we're experimenting just like everyone else. And it's always awesome when one of the domain experts listening to this podcast is able to write back and tell us, actually here's exactly what that is called in a scientific sense and so then i can realize oh well you know this this name that i've been using that made sense in the context of jujitsu it's actually a much bigger thing and psychologists have been able to apply this elsewhere in the world and in life and we're starting to connect the dots between jujitsu and things that people are using in totally different fields and these ideas are just as applicable and that's really what mental models is all about right is you look for these general patterns as to how things work mm -hmm. and once you see them in one place <laughs> it's a lot like the beeping in the background at your gym once you <laughs> once you understand it and you notice it you can't unsee it again you can't unhear it and that's the thing with these mental models is once you start seeing these patterns you realize man i can apply these to everything i do in jujitsu and i can even apply these elsewhere in life you know i can use some of the same um learning and movement strategies here that i do elsewhere and that's one of the cool things about it mm -hmm. um, another thing that's really cool is once you start to build up a library of these concepts you can kind of connect them together in your head and you know this is something that Rob Bernanke does a lot is he has not only all of these little concepts that exist in a bubble, but they all relate to each other. And that is what makes them really, really strong. So, you know, you talked about blading, for example, and how blading is a specific application of force vectors. And you apply those force vectors by minimizing the attack area, the surface area of what you're trying to lead with. That's three mental models that all tie together right so mm -hmm. these things aren't just valuable in and of themselves it is 
greater than the sum of its parts. And once you start understanding more and more of these things, you can combine them in novel ways that improve your understanding of the art as a whole. That's something actually that I realized listening to the famous investor Charlie Munger talk about, where he talked about how you need to have a latticework of mental models, meaning that one is good, but if you've got many of them, you can start combining them to see bigger patterns that you might not have otherwise even known were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's funny how BJJ Mental Models is a it's a grappling show, you know, it's a, it's a martial arts show, but the the ideas that we talk about, a lot of them translate over to other areas of combat, whether it be other martial arts or military warfare. Like when I teach jujitsu, I use a lot of different analogies that I find they cross over in terms of other martial arts, in terms of warfare, because I'm a big fan of uh, military history and things like that. So I listen to a lot of history shows and these things are just, they're everywhere, you know, like mm -hmm. outflanking your opponent, attacking your opponent when they're vulnerable rather than when they're strong. Uh, ranges like these these things are everywhere in combat and they they cross over so it's funny the more that I the more that we do this show the more I realize like how these patterns really are in all aspects of life they show up in funny places where you wouldn't expect them you're like oh there's a there's something that I've mentioned on the show before or whatever and um, it's pretty obvious I think if you kind of you know study the current landscape of jujitsu that conceptual approaches and identifying principles and concepts that's kind of that's on the up now it's becoming more and more obvious that that is a valuable way to look at jujitsu i don't think it's the only way to look at jujitsu you know you could very well argue that it's not the best way to learn jujitsu but it is important to understand the mechanics of why things are working and when you combine that to other learning styles, you know, you can get a really good understanding of grappling. So I think we're going to see more of that conceptual, that conceptual side of jujitsu uh, as as we move on here. Yeah, it's it's funny. I remember hearing that there was this fad where executives in the business world would read Sun Tzu's The Art of War and talk about it like it's a business book, right? And I remember thinking that is such bullshit, right? That like a, you know, a bunch of like suits would basically read this book by this ancient samurai and be like, I'm just the same as him. I used to think that was just, you know, a bunch of stuffy businessmen trying to act like they're badasses. But I realize now that no, there's something actually to that. There are the exact same patterns and strategies that you use you know, hands off in a business sense, even in a single conversation, you can use these exact same strategies that you would use when you're in, you know, a real fight. Combat strategies, they scale all the way up and down. They can apply when you've got, you know, just like a massive battlefront, or they can apply sometimes in even just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There aren't as many differences as we think. And that's one of the reasons why I advocate for jujitsu so much is, you know, you, I think a lot of us, we get into jujitsu thinking that, oh, we're going to use this for self-defense. But in reality, if you stick with it long enough, you use it for learning and for personal growth because it teaches you these, these methods on the ground that you can use in other walks of life as well. Mm -hmm. And even things just like uh, any scenario where there are stressful situations, you have to make decisions, you have to problem solve under pressure. Like these, these situations are everywhere in life. Everyone has them, whether you're a stay at home parent or whether you are a, uh, you know, an, a CEO, some executive at an office or whether you're a chef like I was, everyone's life has an aspect of stress and problem solving and managing, you know, how you're going to, you're going to accomplish tasks in the best way possible and how you're going to be as efficient as possible. And I realized that when I was a chef and when I started doing jujitsu, the lessons I was learning in jujitsu would cross over and help me deal with problems that I would need to solve on the job as a chef and vice versa. The, the stress management that I would have as a chef would cross over when it came time to make decisions as a grappler. So these things do cross over a lot. Anytime, anytime, like I said, there's problem solving situations, stressful situations, uh, not just combatical situations. Th this is where you can really use these mental models and these, and these learning models to, gather and take in more information or pass information on better or to prepare yourself for a particular task or a set of tasks or you know how, how you're going to approach a grand task like competing in a tournament or something like that how are you what is your holistic approach going to be not just like i'm going to get in really good shape i'm going to train a lot but more like how am i going to train my body 
to deal with the hormonal changes that will inevitably happen on fight day, you know, Mm -hmm. conditioning on fight day. And I'm not going, I'm not meaning to go off on a tangent here, but like there's the, there's the physical conditioning, which most people will all consider, you know, get, get running, get, you know, do, do extra stuff aside from jujitsu to get ready for competition. But the stress inoculation part of it also needs to be looked at. So you need to have holistic approaches to every problem solving situation. And then I really recommend that most people take these after you complete whatever task it is to sort of do a debrief and say, okay, we did this well, we could have done this better. You know, how can we make adjustments for next time? And then in that way, you really build that Kaizen lifestyle over, over a set of time, because every time you, you know, you want to make sure that you improved more than the last time. So that is something that I've, I've, I've taken throughout jujitsu, uh, throughout my culinary career with the podcast, being a parent, er, anything in general, it's like, okay, how can we make adjustments, do things better next time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a few things you brought up there that I've noticed the same, you know, they're just as applicable to jujitsu as off the mat. And that is that you always want to consciously own and drive your own personal growth. There are a lot of people who just show up to jujitsu and do what their instructor does and have some fun rolling, but they never really consciously think about what it is that they want to do. They never train with purpose, right? They just kind of show up and they let the class happen to them and they let the roles happen to them. And they're never really thinking at a higher level about, okay, how can I what would I need to do to be better here? And you brought up a great example in the context of competition where you don't just show up to competition and let it happen if you want to really succeed. You have to actively own your conditioning both physically and mentally and have a strategy and execute on that strategy. And that's very much the same as what you see in the workplace. You know, there are people who get frustrated because they never get promoted or they never get that raise. But honestly, if you look at what they're doing on the job, I would ask them, are you actively owning your career or are you letting your career just happen to you? Are you showing up every day, just doing the same thing over and over again without growing, without changing, without doing something to advance your skill and your value to the business? That's the kind of stuff that's going to get you promoted and help you grow your influence and your money over the long term. If you just show up every day and let work happen to you, then of course you're not going to get promoted. So it's interesting because that same active mindset is required both in jujitsu and off the mats as well. Mm -hmm. I'm in kind of a unique situation because of my profession where I wear a lot of different hats, you know, like during the day I'm, I, I watch my kids most of the time. And then in the evening I go do jujitsu. So I get to be a competitor. I get to do my, what I love for a, li- a living. I get to be a, an entrepreneur. When someone comes in, I'm a salesman, you know, uh, I'm, I'm also, I sort of consider myself like a bit of a servant. Like I really want to help my students quite often. I'll stay after class and chit chat with them. Or I even, this week I'm sort of calling back. We've been doing some shutdowns recently. So I'm calling the parents just to have like a 20 minute chat with the kids just so that, you know, especially the ones that haven't really come back from the first shutdown because I want to maintain a relationship with them. But it's like, it's really important to think about how can you use mental models to sort of enhance every area of your life. And when you, when you have a a profession or multiple professions for that matter, where you have to wear a lot of hats solve a lot of different problems, it's really important to think like, okay, how am I going to approach this? And in this case, you know, I'm trying to be as authentic as possible. I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. Anyone who comes to my school knows that my, you know, my contracts are very forgiving. They're very flexible where I, you know, I've been, I don't know about you. I've been part of gyms where you're kind of, you sign up and then you're locked in and there's no flexibility within the contract. And it really puts a lot of people's Uh, It gives them a bad taste when they go to these gyms. And I've had so many students come to me telling me about these horror stories about how they get locked in. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll just offer the complete opposite. I'll give you the most flexible contract possible. I'm, you know, if uh, if you need to pause it for whatever reason, that's fine. If you want to refund for whatever reason, that's fine. And it's had amazing response because people Hey, weird. People do not like to get locked into contracts where they have no control over their future. Right. So it's like. A lot of it has when I'm thinking about, oh, how can I, you know, be a better businessman? How can I be a better entrepreneur and reason with people more? It's like I look at what other businesses are doing that piss people off. And then I'm like, I'm just going to avoid that tactic. (laughs) (laughs) Like I'm going to avoid cheesy marketing. I'm going to avoid 
trapping people in contracts, rigid contracts and, and things like that. And, you know, I'm lucky. Part of me is I can do it. But another part of me is like, I know that if I take sacrifices here and there, you know, as a businessman, it pays back in time because you build loyalty. And I find that customer loyalty is one of the most important things for uh, running your own business. Yeah, that's one of the things I found too, just with the the model that we've got here, where we're primarily supported by patrons. So we're always trying to give the most value to them that we possibly can. And, you know, we're, we've experimented with a lot of different ways. You know, we've We've been talking about, you know, well, what if we just built like this massive library of stuff? But at some point I realized, you know, <laughs> is this the right approach? Maybe if we just treat these people with care and legitimately try to help them and talk to them and build that relationship, that's going to be way more valuable mm. than another video subscription site, yeah. right? That's, that's the kind of thing. And I think bringing it back to basics and trying to identify what you really believe in and what the real value is and what you're trying to do and focus on driving that, that's going to be the thing that is going to help you succeed over the long term more than any little gimmicks or tricks or tactics that you would use to, you know, drive up attention to your product. It's a, it's the long game. And I think the best way to play the long game is something else that we've talked about on the podcast, identify your first principles, the things that really you believe should drive everything else and to just very vigorously stick to those first principles. That's something that is critical. And it, it sounds like one of the principles that you brought up and one, one that I would agree with as well is, you know, focus on quality and building relationships and, you know, trying to treat your customers right. Mm -hmm. I, I have been to gyms that use those marketing tactics where I feel like it focuses on volume and bringing people into the gym as opposed to offering the best jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like if you have a restaurant where you're trying to get as many people into the restaurant, but you don't care about their experience. You know, you don't care like the quality of the food or the service that you give. So maybe a bunch of people want to check out this this cool new restaurant or whatever, but then they go and it sucks. I mean, the chance of them coming back are really small. So building that guest loyalty where you are trying to offer the best product, they, they can see that you're trying to offer the best product pretty much for the first few years. Any money that I made off the gym just went right back into the gym. You know, oh, I get an extra grand. Oh, I'm going to buy an assault bike now because I want to have an assault bike for myself and for my students. And that'll make us better competitors. It'll show the guys, hey, I'm willing to invest in this place. Money that I make won't just go into my, you know, my savings account. It's going to go back into the gym because I want to keep improving it until the point where I feel like it can't be improved anymore. And I feel like I've actually reached that point now because we just finished our last renovations so we're pretty much this is how the gym's going to be basically until we move out of here in a few years, you know, Lord willing. So when you put money back into a business and you keep making it a more fun place to be around and a, and a higher quality place to be around, people will just come back. You won't have to beg them to come back. They're going to come because it's that good or they enjoy it that much. And yeah, coming from a place of, you know, putting the art first instead of uh, instead of trying to get rich. The two careers that I've had, if you if you become a chef or a martial arts instructor to get rich, you're going to have really shitty food, really shitty martial arts. And uh, it's really obvious, you know, you, you can see the people that have done that and built their business on that. And generally speaking, they, they either don't last or they're full of people who are just not high level. And I would prefer to have students that are high level. And the way that our gym is built, it, it attracts a certain type of you know, someone who puts standards ahead of promotions. So mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the environment that we try and foster. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's always the best way to go. And I know how tempting it can be to deviate from that path, you know, especially when you see other people getting these huge returns and maybe on the surface, it looks like they haven't done things the right way to earn them. But I think that over the long time, you're more likely to be better off if you stick to your principles and you create your business based on your principles. And moreover, even if you did manage to succeed doing unscrupulous things, would you really be happy about it, right? It's, I think, better to win with principles than it is to win without them. So something else I wanted to get into is to talk a little bit about all of these experts that we talked to. So in the last 10 episodes, especially, we've reached out to get a, a bunch of the world's best thinkers when it comes to the gentle art and get them on the show here. And that's not the first time either. We've had guests on before in, you know, special occasions or if someone was around and we wanted to get them on. But generally, we 
hadn't really been a guest based show. And I, I don't think we ever really will be a guest based show, even in the situations where we do have guests, we try to integrate them into the format of this show where they come in with a topic they want to discuss. And we have a big long form, deep conversation about that topic, about a, an area that they're passionate in. So when we have guests on the show and we discuss something, a lot of the time we're discussing it because it's either something they are passionate about and specifically wanted to talk about or something that we thought they would be a very good speaker on because they have valid personal experience. And I've actually been really shocked in a lot of ways in terms of our interactions with these guests. I mean, Matt, I don't know about you, but one of the things that really blew my mind was how easy it was to get them on this show. I mean, I thought that it would be just a struggle to try to get some of these, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, celebrity grapplers on the show. But I was absolutely blown away by how generous they were with their time to, you know, to come on here and spend, you know, well over an hour sometimes dropping and sharing knowledge freely with us and for our listeners. Yeah, I agree. It was definitely, definitely flattering when we, what, the first like 80 episodes, maybe we didn't have guests or we would just pepper in a guest here or there. And then on the, on the home stretch to 100, we started really getting a lot of guests. And, and I think it's because we didn't even think like, would people even want to spend their time to be on our show? Yeah. And, um, you know, what's really great is, is having guests that specialize in a certain aspect or they've, they've had a certain concept that's really helped them out. Like, you know, Travis Stevens for, you know, his competition experience or Seb Lavois for his law enforcement or, I mean, these, these people are specialists in what they do. So having them come on our show and share, share their knowledge and give us their free time, you know, literally asking for nothing in return is, it is flattering, it's rewarding, uh, and, and it's really special. And like you said, I don't, I don't think we ever will be a f- fully a guest you know, show where we are, we purely just interview people, but it's definitely cool to mix it up, have them in here. It kind of just validates the hard work that we're doing because it shows, Hey, like we can have these, these high level guests on our show and they're, they're willing to give us the time um, because maybe they think it'll give them the exposure they need or whatever. So it's, it's, uh, I think it's definitely just it sort of reconfirms that we're moving in the right direction. It's very motivating. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, I know when we, you know, reached out to Travis Stevens, for example, I thought like, there's no way this guy is going to just drop everything and be on the show with us. Like, you know, who the hell are we? Why, why would like an Olympian just show up on our, our little piss ant podcast and waste his time with us? But we reached out and he was totally in and he was awesome as a guest. I mean, he shared so much knowledge. I mean, that episode is one of my favorites. Like just listening to that guy talk is so inspirational. I think it is my favorite one out of all the ones that we've done. It's probably my favorite. I absolutely love that one. In retrospect, that one was so special. I kind of wish we had timed it for episode 100, but I, you know, we had no way of knowing that it was going to come out quite the way that it did. Mm -hmm. But I mean, he was totally willing to just come on and spend significant portions of his time with us. He, He didn't know who we were beforehand. Well, I've I've bought some of his cool gear. So I've been emailing him <laughs> because I bought, he's got these awesome, uh, he's got these awesome shirts. It says coffee and metals on it. Cause I, oh, those I, are his, and you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take credit for this, but we, I was watching a live Q and a, you planted the seeds. <laughs> he was doing, he was doing a lot of live Q and A's, you know, at the beginning of the lockdown, I think he just really started pushing his YouTube channel again, just adapting out of this, uh, you know, this, this pandemic event. And he, um, he was starting to do a lot of Q and A's and just putting out a lot more content. And I was watching it and I noticed this guy's like always drinking coffee, right? Like he, and he would, he would mention about, okay, I need coffee now. And just like, and I'm like, well, I love coffee too. I remember, I, I think I commented something like coffee and metals and he's like coffee and metals. Yeah, that's awesome. We should do coffee and metals shirts. And then I go on his, on his website, like a week later, he's got coffee and metal stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, like, I, I don't know. It probably wasn't me, but that is, it is awesome. Okay. Maybe then you did plant the seeds. Maybe there's more to this than I thought. Cause you were the one who did the reach outs to Travis. But I, I remember when we were running up to episode a hundred, I thought, you know what? I wonder if we can get Lachlan and Livia. So I just messaged them on Reddit and said, 
hey, you want to join? And Lachlan said, yeah. Well, actually, I, I guess what he actually said was like, oi, yeah, mate, love to, yeah. or something like that. Crikey. <laughs> but he he and Livia were just like totally down. And I I don't think, I mean, maybe he did at least know who we were because he's pretty active on Reddit like me. But still, I mean, you know, we'd never really spoken before. And he and his wife were more than happy to just like drop some world-class knowledge with us. And, you know, all of these guests have said, you know, we'd love to come back again. They've been super supportive of the show. And that is one of the cool things about this martial art is you can reach out to some of the best in the world and they'll be more than happy to talk to you and help you out. And I mean, I, I can't imagine that in many other walks of life where you could just like, you know, reach out to like an A-list celebrity and they'll, they'll just drop everything to give you some of their time for free. But mm. they've been so helpful and so supportive that, I mean, I, it, it's interesting because it kind of makes me feel like we have to use our platform to help them. So mm -hmm. we're always out there on social trying to promote guys like, you you know, like Preet Mikkelsen and Robert Deagle and Lachlan and Livia. You know, if people come on here to help us, we want to help them back. And it's just, it's so cool that BJJ Mental Models has given us a vehicle to build relationships with some of our heroes, right? That's mm -hmm. not something that uh, I thought would ever be an opportunity for us. Yeah, for sure. And and I mean, just before we move on, that episode with Travis, I remember by the end of that episode, I was like, uh, I was buzzing. Like I, I had uh, goosebumps because I was asking him about his, you know, how he addresses competition nerves. And we he was describing. I could feel it. Yeah. Yeah. He was describing, you know, in, in the tunnel going out there for the Olympics. And I, I and I felt like I was there. I felt like I could feel it, it was different from usual visualization for competitions because the way he was like, you know, he's worked with sports psychologists or whatever. And he was saying like, oh, you can feel the tape on your fingers. You can feel the tatami on your feet. You know, now you're walking out, you can feel your lungs breathing. It's the first minute of the match and your throat is just burning and your heart is pounding, you know, and you feel like you're going to pass out. And I'm like, fuck, like, I know what that's like. I, I feel that every time. And some of the information that he shared on that episode, I directly took that and added it to my preparation for my recent match against Lucas. And it like, dude, I felt so calm out there because leading up to the match, like a month before I, you know, I would think about it and I'd be, and my mind would start to go places. I'd get nervous and be like, you know, I haven't competed since the beginning of the year. And when you did, you got smashed. It wasn't a good showing the last competition. Like this guy is good. You know, I've seen him on, on events fighting high level guys. And, uh, you know, what if he does this to me? But then I just thought like, okay, think about what Travis said. Like, think about, think about his preparation. Th imagine, imagine yourself in uncomfortable uh, situations. Imagine, you know, how your lungs feel. Imagine how your heart feels and your throat feels, how, how your eyeballs feel when you're exhausted, you know, and, and like that visualization, it really helped me go out there and stay calm. And I felt calm the whole time. So it was, it was, uh, you know, talking to guys like this and being able to pick their brains, man, it is such a useful tool and it's helped me so much for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I like how some of them, you know, they, they say things that on the surface seem contradictory or different from what maybe we would expect. And, you know, I remember when John Thomas was on here and he was talking about how he generally doesn't like principles. And at first I thought like, what are you talking about, man? It doesn't everyone in jujitsu like principles. But then I, when I was listening back to the episode, I realized, no, this guy's saying something very, very different. This guy is talking about blindly following orders, right? He's talking about how, when, when you are given a principle, like you must follow this, you can be misleading your students because they don't have the nuance to understand that well, there are no firm rules in jujitsu, right? You know, maybe this thing applies 90% of the time, but that other 10% of the time at a high level, it's going to make or break you. So you can be misleading your students if you tell them that there are no exceptions to these things. And I, that really changed the way that I think about how I convey information. Uh, because, you know, initially when we started BJJ Mental Models, I would, in some of my writing, I would say like, do this, do that. And I try not to be so prescriptive now. I try not to make it sound like there are hard and fast rules because there there aren't any, right? And and that, in fact, is a mental model. There is a guy named Shane Parrish. He runs the excellent mental model platform called Farnham Street. And one of the mental models he talks about is the map is not the territory. And what he means by that is, you know, you can have all of these mental models and they're great, but 
you got to understand that most of them, they're not true 100% of the time. They're representations of something. They're guideposts, but they're not always guaranteed to be 100% accurate. So although you can use them, you have to also have the mental flexibility to know that they don't apply all of the time. And you have to have that critical thinking to know when you're outside of those guidelines, and maybe you have to go against what you would normally consider to be good advice. Yeah, and that reminds me of uh, the recent Robert Deagle episode. He he referred to that, uh, what was that theory? Wittgenstein's ladder. I think you pronounced it wrong, and I think he'd kick the shit out of you if you heard that. Is Vic Wittgenstein? Wittgenstein. Uh, eh, everyone says it wrong. I think I think it was Wicken, Wittgenstein. Wick, I think Wittgenstein's ladder. Wittgenstein's ladder, and basically, it is. It's kind of the opposite of what what you just said, where you are giving rules that could intentionally be. I don't know if false is the term or misleading. Incomplete. Incomplete. And it guides you to adopt certain habits or understandings that will prevent you from making early mistakes. Whereas as you become higher level and you get more of a deeper holistic understanding of the subject, in this case, jujitsu, you understand that, okay, these rules actually don't exist. They were just put there to sort of teach me as a beginner and guide me in the right direction. Now that I'm of a certain rank, I understand, okay, I can cross my feet when I'm on the back. You know, that's a common thing you're taught when you're a white belt. Don't cross your feet when you have someone's back. They're going to footlock you. Yes, there is truth to that. And it's good to teach a white belt that rule because they will get their points in competitions. They will be aware of the footlock. But ultimately, when you get to a certain level, you're going to start crossing your ankles because it's it's such a good way to control your partner. You know, there are certain rule sets where it makes sense to cross your ankles. Points don't matter. You get a higher degree of control. So that is a rule that is taught to a lot of beginners to make sure that they avoid certain mistakes and they're aware of certain attacks. But in the end, it is a rule meant to be broken. Yeah. And on the podcast before, we've talked about that as incremental learning, how you need your students to be ready for the next lesson before you give it to them. Because if you give them all of the lessons at once, you're going to overload them and they're not really going to maximize their learning. Like you can't teach someone as if they're a black belt, if they're a white belt, you need to build them up to that level. And it's interesting how a lot of the things that at the beginning, which we think are hard and fast rules, they turn out not to be. And so, yeah, it's interesting because there's different ways to look at this, right? On one hand, I mean, John Thomas was of the mind that, you know, these kinds of commandments are bad because there's exceptions and you're going to confuse people. But then on the other hand, you've got guys like Robert Deagle saying, no, it's okay to parcel out this information because people aren't ready for the next lesson yet. And that's another thing that I've kind of taken away from these discussions. It's that, it all depends. A lot of the time, especially when you're at a very high level, there is no hard and fast answer. And you might be seeking that, but you're probably not going to find it because everything is situational and contextual. And it takes experience and wisdom to be able to identify the right tool for the right job. I mean, it, it reminds me of the episodes you were doing with Seb, where you were like painting this very specific situation. Like, well, what if, you know, there's two armed assailants and a Denny's and blah, 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 blah. And Seb's answer was always, well, it depends. Yeah. Because of course it does, right? Like there's no one magic answer that's going to answer everything. And if you're experienced enough, you know that. Mm -hmm. And all of these mental models, they're tools, and you can combine them together to really create profound learning, but very few of them are going to be hard and fast rules. And although they're helpful, you need mental flexibility to know when to move away from them. It reminds me of that thing Travis was talking about where you kind of develop an oh shit meter where, you know, you're driving, you're at a four point stop sign and there's a car that stopped at the same time as you. And you're kind of like wondering if you should go. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of just read the situation. And you're like, fuck it, I'm going to go. So it's kind of it's kind of like one of those things where, you know, I'm asking Seb all these questions, thinking I can give him more more specific details on the scenario as if that's going to give him more of a more of a determined answer as to how he would address each scenario. But really, it comes down to the oh shit meter, man. Like it, he has to he has to assess all the factors, the risk versus rewards. He has to think, OK, like, who am I with? You know, am I outnumbered? Is there a, is there an escape strategy? If shit goes wrong, do I need, you know, is there ways that I can manage the distance? It all comes down to that oh shit meter that Travis was talking about where it's just, you know, in the moment, 
if you've done enough preparation and you're and you are prepared and you know how how to assess tasks and problem solve it'll happen in the moment and a lot of the time it is automatic i think a lot of this stuff if you're trained well that's why i like things like mental models because they allow you to absorb these big guidelines that you can hold in your head and make decisions with relatively quickly. The example we give so frequently on BJJ mental models is the difference between concepts and techniques. If you're just trying to memorize every single variant of a technique, you're never really going to be able to internalize all of that and make snap decisions through rote memorization. At some point, you need to think at a higher level and that's where mental models come into play. And when you need to make snap decisions, I find that mental models are such a powerful way of being able to make good decisions with very limited time. Yep, for sure. So Matt, yeah. before we tie this up, any other closing thoughts that you want to add? Not really. Just wanted to say thanks to everyone again. I mean, it's a, like we talked about, it's a labor of love. It's, it's jujitsu. It's what we love to do. I love to share jujitsu. I know Steve does too. And uh, man, here's to the next hundred episodes. It's been, uh, it's been a blast. Thank you. So maybe we can quickly run down some of the mental models we talked about here today. We talked about investing in loss, like with the podcast, like with jujitsu. If you want to get good at something, you got to be willing to be bad at it first. That's what investing in loss is all about. We talked about the scientific method. One of the ways that you do get better at something is objectively doing experiments, understanding what worked and what didn't, and applying those learnings to the next go round. We talked about blading, force vectors, and minimizing attack vectors all in the same breath, basically as an example of how you can combine mental models together and sometimes see learnings with the combination that might not be obvious when you look at them individually. We talked about asymmetric warfare, useful not just in jujitsu, but also in business, finding the things that you are uniquely good at where there is an opening that you can exploit. We talked about Kaizen, the process of continuous improvement, making sure that through every cycle you try to get better. It's not about winning or losing, it's about improving. We talked about training with purpose and how if you want to get better at jujitsu over the long term, you can really accelerate your growth by having specific goals for how to get better in every session. That's not just going to help you when you're training in the gym. It's also going to help you when you're prepping for competition. It's also going to help you build your career. We talked about first principles, the idea that you can distill everything down to some core principles and then build your strategies back up around those. As an example, if you believe that being ethical and creating a quality product are first principles, you can use those as guideposts to build a business like a jujitsu gym. We talked about how the map is not the territory and how mental models can be extremely powerful, but you also have to have the foresight to know that they don't always apply and to know when you need to deviate from them. And we talked about incremental learning, how sometimes you want to parcel out lessons. You need your students to be ready for the next lesson before you provide it to them. There is a ladder that you have to climb if you want people to grow up into an experienced state. So Matt, Looking forward to another 100 episodes. Again, if you want us to be around for another 100 episodes, the best thing you can do is support us on Patreon. That's the best way to help us keep the lights on. If you want to support us there, you can go to patreon.com slash bjjmentalmodels. Again, that's patreon.com slash bjjmentalmodels. That's how you'll get access to our Discord community, narrated roles from Matt and myself, and a bunch of other value adds that we provide to our patrons. You can also go to our store, bjjmentalmodels.com com slash store. That's where you can pick up gi patches, t-shirts, and hoodies. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash join, which is how you can get on our mailing list. We blast out a newsletter every Friday to accompany the show. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com, the mothership website, where you can see the whole database of concepts that we talk about here on the show, and you can check us out on Facebook and on Instagram. Yeah, again, thank you guys. And uh, thanks to all the patrons. And it's a pleasure to be on the Discord as well as making those videos. So let's keep it rolling. Keep the momentum going. Keep growing the show. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening to us get all long-winded over the first 100 episodes. Talk to you next time. Take care, guys. Bye.